I always wonder how the Southern Baptists down south handle scripture like today, right? I'm not quite sure how to handle it sometime either. Uh, but what do you suppose is the uh, most expensive bottle of wine ever sold? Any guess how much was paid for it? Well, you know what? Screaming Eagle Cabernet purchased in um, 1992 for a mere $500,000. At a charity auction, you gotta mind you, because I understand that you people can actually buy it for five or $6,000, um, I guess at a, from a private seller or maybe a, a private auction. So it's not really the most expensive. The most expensive actually sold for what it was, around what it was worth was Chateau Cheval Blanc, a 1947 vintage, sold for $304,000 in 2010. Anyone interested? Anyone buy anything like that? Most people I know who drink wine, not all of us do drink wine, but those who do drink wine, most people I know are, are in the two digit figures. Now I've known a few three digit people uh, who uh, wines and they always uh, get an invitation I usually go <laughs> <laughs> but most of us don't want to spend that much money it's an outrageous <laughs> amount of money to spend you know my theory is you, you buy something under $20 you can get close to 10 and you buy the best you can in that range of price and then you're doing pretty well if you like wine at all but here we go and people pay all kinds of prices for that wine. And if someone were to offer me a really nice taste of a really expensive wine, I'm guessing I would probably take it. In fact, it's happened one time in my life. Uh, I had a small group that we led up in Chicago, up, up in Winnetka, and there was a guy there who had probably the best wine cellar, one of the best wine cellars on the North Shore, and that's saying a lot, right? And uh, he was a very loving man, uh, made a lot of money, gave away a lot of money. And uh, he went to a charity auction. He bought this bottle of wine for $800 was what it was supposed to be worth, $800. And he invited us to his house. We didn't know he was going to open. So we were having a party, and people were drinking other wines that they had brought and having a nice time. And um, right before we left, he said, I've got a bottle of wine, bro. He opened up that bottle of wine and gave us each just a small little taste of this. And you know, I, I have all these people in that church who are sommeliers, they're well, sommeliers wannabe, you know. You know, and I, I was listening to that word today in French. For, read the word sommelier like it's spelled in French, and you leave the M out, you know what it spells? Some liar. Because I figure people who are always talking about the taste of wine, they're saying what they think is, but may not really be tasting it. You know, so there's some liars. Yeah, I like that. Um, so I, I'm watching everyone else, what they're doing and how they're going about it. And they get that, and they're, they're, they're swirling the wine in their glass, and they're looking at it, and they're, they're watching the legs crawl down and see how much sugar is in it. And then they're putting their noses down deep into the wine, which looks really strange when you look at a distance. And they're sniffing it, and then they're taking the first sip. And I took the first, followed along, did all those things I thought I was supposed to do, and I took a taste of that wine. And I don't know how to describe the taste of wine. I'm really terrible at this. And this is not going to meet any wine spectator standard for how you describe wine. But that wine was kind of like that chewing gum in Willy Wonka factory, you know, the ones the kids eat and it changes flavor several times. It's like, oh, it's roast beef or it's, it's mashed potatoes, it's corn. Well, it kind of had that ability to change flavors. It was surprising. I couldn't describe the flavors and it was nice. But, you know, I thought it really cool that our friend opened up the nicest bottle of wine at the end, towards the end of the party, and we were all treated, and we felt very honored by that. Now, today we have a scripture that is uh, a well-known scripture in the Bible. Today we are going to savor together a vintage scripture from the Gospel of John that has 
a rich multi-layers of flavor for us to dissect and understand and appreciate. And this nice savoring is something um, that uh, people down south always love this scripture. Now, I, I grew up down south drinking was something, if someone was drinking, they were potentially on the road to hell. And one of the signs of salvation that, that smoothed the way for salvation was that you'd given up drinking. That was a sign that you were serious about being saved and coming into the faith. Because they understood um, that, hell, that, that, that they could take you to hell. Well, you know, there's some truth to that, right? Because everyone here knows someone who's been to hell because of alcohol. And even if that, you, don't, you know that person, you may know it because you're in a relationship, and that's put you through hell. So when I talk on this scripture, I, I want to mark that because alcohol can be a very devastating, dangerous thing in people's lives. But uh, so th these friends of mine, these Southern Baptists, I, I want to call them liberal Southern Baptists, but that seems to be oxymoronic, uh, you know, something you can't really say. And uh, they always thought, well, great, we've got this scripture, and Jesus drinks wine. Not only does he drink wine, Jesus makes wine and serves it to all these guests, all these people who probably already had enough to drink. They, hey, what's wrong with me having my occasional bourbon or, you know, beer? Nothing wrong with that. But that's not what the scripture's about. It's not a moral lesson telling us it's okay to drink wine or okay to drink beer or, or alcohol. In fact, that's a very shallow way to approach the text. It is actually a scripture about transformation, about powerful. It is actually a symbol of something of who Jesus is and what God is doing in our lives. Jesus goes there with his disciples. He goes with Mary, his mother. One of the few stories we have like this with Jesus in his adult life where Mary is featured in the story. And he goes there to a wedding. Must have been a wealthier family, as Susan had suggested. And horror of horror. They have no wine. They have run out of wine. And Mary is just horrified that this has happened. She can see a social disaster because this groom, who the night of his life is supposed to treat everyone, is going to have everyone walking away from his party pretty soon because the wine is gone and he didn't think to buy enough wine. And he's going to be considered stingy for the rest of his life. It is a social faux pas. You remember the movie Apocalypse Now? There's, there's a line that I think of in that movie. The horror, the horror, you know, the horror. They've run out of wine. They don't have any. And Mary says, I know what I can do about this. And she says, Jesus, Jesus, son, you got to rescue them. Go, go do something about this. You're the only one who can. And Jesus says, Mom, it's not time for that. And I think as a pastor, I know what he's saying, you know. As a pastor, I'm, I'm just at the party. I don't want to have to be on. I just want to enjoy myself with my buddies, right? But that's not what it's saying at all. If you listen to the line, the way it's printed, and it's, it's translated very well by all the translations, it says, my hour has not come. Now, that is not just a simple, that's a loaded little phrase here, my hour has not come. It's all through the gospel that you will see those words, my hour has not come. And it comes at the end of the gospel. What's the hour? What's Jesus' hour? What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the cross. Because in John's gospel, the cross is not a sign of suffering and pain as it is in the synoptic gospels. It is a place where he is lifted up on the throne. And the light of Christ that is in Jesus shines upon the people God's grace is shining out into the world for all to see. God's glory is revealed through Jesus. And people either run and hide because they're, they're scared of being seen or they realize the grace and love of Christ in their lives and they become followers of Christ. So the hour of Jesus is that moment when he's lifted on the cross and when he is resurrected and then when he ascends. And all through John's gospel, we have these series of stories 
that are called sign stories. They're not really miracles, they're really sign stories. And they reveal glimpses of that moment that happens on the cross. The light of Christ glimmers through, and the same thing happens that happens when he's up on the cross. Not everyone sees it. Most people don't. Most people don't realize what's happened. It's just light. For some people, they know it's the light of God, the light of love. And that's true as what happens in this story. Jesus performs the miracle, and servants take him to the water, performs the miracle, and the wines, they take it to the wine steward, the guy in charge, the one that take him a, a, a cup of it and say, here, here's the one, see if it meets, meets standards. So he goes, oh, he walks, over to the, he walks over to the groom at the party and says, oh, sir, sir, this is amazing. This is such amazing wine, and you, you didn't bring it out first. You brought the best stuff out last. It's amazing. No one does that, and you got all these jars full of it. Extravagance, so much that they'll never drink it all. And it's the best that they could possibly be. Wow. For him and most people, it is what? The best party of their life. For the disciples, it's much more than that. It is life itself. It is the best moment of their life. Because we're told that in this first sign that Jesus does, they come to understand who Jesus is. They are transformed. Something within their, themselves is not the same. Their worldview is changed. They don't just see the party and think, oh, how good God is. They think there's a God behind what's happening. And there's a God behind everything that happens in my life. All the gifts of my life are being blessed. And they begin to realize what a gift their lives are and how God is always present and always transforming life, always transforming things. And they get to recognize that. It's a transformation of the heart. It's a difference between stagnant, stale, tasteless water and vibrant, powerful, robust wine. It's the difference between getting by in life and having abundance in life, not just length, though that it's included in this, but quality of life. It's the difference between making the most of life and going through the motions and realizing that there's some deeper meaning and purpose to this life of which I have a chance to share in that makes life have a wondrous quality like a wondrous glass of wine. And that's the power of the story. It couldn't be a more powerful image, this transformation of water to wine. Now, here's the other thing that the story tells me. It's a comparison between religions. Remember the water? The water was what from ritual jars. They were used for ritual. It was a symbol of religion, not just Jewish religion. It's really a symbol for all religion that has water in it. It's tasteless, placid, stale, stagnant. It's something. It's important, but there's another level. The other level is the vibrant wine. Because the story is telling us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. And what happens in the prophecy? Some of the prophets talk about that day will come where wine will flow freely and people will be joyful and there will be a great party and everyone will partake of that food and that wine and that feeling and people will feel deep love and devotion that people feel sometimes when they go to a party. Right? It will transform the spirit of people. There will be connection and there will be a sense of love between people and there will be a sense of abundance in people's lives. They're not going to be the same because of that transformation that takes place, that powerful moment. And I think about how oftentimes we turn religion into something that is focused on the externals rather than the internal. We think that religion, and many people think this, I hear it all the time, that religion is primarily about being a good person. It's primarily about morality and that avoiding being punished so we, we may receive something and be rewarded. 
And even Christianity has this gospel. That's what we often turn it into. We want to make it just a moralistic religion. And when it's really about that transformation that takes place, a transformation of the heart, a transformation of the attitudes in our heart. Now, the outward external things matter, but, they, but what really matters is the transformation that takes place. And when that happens from deep within, you then live those attitudes and what you do in your life. That's how you live it. I mean, think about Thanksgiving. You know, you can go through life and you can have something nice happen. Yeah, I'm happy, thanks, that's good. Or you can go, wow, what a gift that was. You can take something. Um, I remember once hiking and I was starved because we, we were lost and we hiked like 18, 19 miles in the mountains with backpacks and we didn't have any food. And I hated tomato soup and someone handed me a cup of wonderful warm tomato soup and we finally got to the campsite late. And I didn't know if I was going to find the campsite. I hate tomato soup. It was the best thing I ever put in my mouth. I felt such gratitude for my life for what I've been given. And when you feel gratitude in your life, what happens? And you feel mercy, you start feeling compassion for other people, right? I mean, if you've experienced love and compassion, it makes you prone to show compassion to others. You're moved by it, you do something about it. You can't help but want to do it. And you become more generous when you feel thankful. Why? Because I've received something. I want to share what I have with others. I don't want to hold on to it. And furthermore, I trust that there is one who is giving to me and because I'm being given to, I can hold on to things much lightly and I can share with others and know that there is one who will provide, that there is enough in this world. I don't have to hoard it. And I don't have to support attitudes in our country that hoard things and keep other people from having it. That's powerful stuff. Because... It teaches us attitudes like kindness that we live out. Attitudes for generosity. Those are the dispositions of the heart. Now, there's a movie that I, Les Mis, most people have seen Les Mis. Love. I don't even want to, how do you say La Misera? No, I can't say it correctly. Uh, but uh, it, it, I'm not good on my French. But it's a great movie and play and book. Uh, and uh, there's a character in that movie. The main character is a man who who has lost everything, he has nothing, he's very poor and his sister is starving and so are her seven children and he steals bread in order to feed his sister and those seven children because there's not enough food for them. And he's arrested and put into prison for 19 years, some of those years for escaping, but many of those years because he stole to feed his family. And when he gets out, he's still destitute and he doesn't know what to do with his life. And Jean is his name, Jean Valjean, uh, doesn't have any place to work. No one will give him a job because he has a yellow card, yellow papers, which is a symbol he's an ex-con. No one will hire him. So he goes and he stays in a small town with a priest. And the priest is a very loving family. He stays here for many days. And then one day, he slips away at night, goes into the dining room, and steals much of the silver in that dining room and escapes and goes away. The police catch up with him, and they bring him back to the priest, to the, to the bishop, and they say, this is the guy who stole this stuff from you. We found the stuff on his hands. And the, the priest goes, oh, no, sir, you misunderstand. I am mad at you, Gene, mad at you. you. You didn't take the candlesticks as well that I meant to give you. And I, I, I'm buying your soul with these things, and you need to take them. Well, he leaves and he's confused by it. And he steals again from, a, from a, a boy and he realizes what the man did for him and he feels terrible about it. And he goes and finds the man because he knows he's done something wrong. His whole life is changed by this one event. There's this sense of gratitude that's been shown to him. And if you've seen this before, you know what happens later. There's the there's the other, the, 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 uh, the, the policeman who presents his life trying to pursue and catch up with him because he knows that he's guilty. But 
he, in the meantime, has gone and made a lot of money and uh, started a factory. In that factory, he hires poor people. He makes sure they have enough food and they're paid a proper wage. And he's achieved great fame because people love him and he's a loving person. But the sheriff, the policeman, chases him. Because why? Because the policeman has religion too, but his religion is morality. You do right, you benefit. You do wrong, you're going to be punished and punished to what the law says. He doesn't understand grace. But Gene, he understands grace. And that is what the difference between old religion and true Christian and Christian religion, which is a transformation of the inner self. My preaching uh, professor said, one time he went to a small country church in the summertime, he's at the summer church, they've got the witness up because it's hot, trying to get some air in there, and the preacher's up there, and he's preaching, and he's, he's saying things like, um, uh, be not first to try something new because the bird in the hand is worth more than two in a bush. And uh, um, be not uh, one who wants to make change real quickly. And he goes on with mumbling moralisms like that. And while he's trying to listen to this sore sermon, someone comes up to the window. This guy goes, psst, psst. And Fred says, what do you want? says, I know a place where there's a pearl worth more than all the pearls in the whole world. He says, that's ridiculous. He said, no, no, I know a place where there is a treasure. It's hidden in a field. <laughs> that's absurd to think there's a treasure hidden in a field. I'm trying to listen to the sermon. But I know a king who welcomes the bums off the street and serves them a feast with everybody else. Ha! <laughs> That's impossible. No king would do that. Well, he walks away. The man walks away. And after the service, he went up to the pastor. You know, I'm sorry. You saw me distracted over there because some fellow was trying to talk to him. He was telling me about there being a pearl of great price that, that, that I ought to go buy. He was telling me about a, you know, about a bum sitting and eating with the king and trying to get me to follow him. He says, well, I... I stayed here and listened to the sermon. Did any, the preacher said, well, did anyone, did anyone follow him? He said, no, no one followed him. But I did see 12 people with him. And our gospel says, our gospel says, Jesus performed his first sign, his first miracle at Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory. And disciples were the only ones who believed and followed on that day. And it's a choice we all have to make. What kind of religion do we live? Is it one of the heart of intention of transformation? Or is it one of the externalism, and just moralisms and punishment and reward? There's something more profound that God has to share with you. And that, my friends, is the wine that we have to savor and enjoy for a lifetime. Amen.